Hi, I'm Eric Choka, and we're at Bonobo's Restaurant here in New York City. And I'm here with Donna Peroni from Accent on Wellness. And we're here for part of a great lecture series she has with incredible speakers like Fred Vichy, Doug Graham, Rio, and a lot of them are amazing authors, too. So, Donna, how are you doing? I'm doing great tonight. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited, too. Tell me, who do we have tonight? We have Victoria Moran. She's a, an author. She's written about 10 books. And her latest book is called Younger by the Day. Uh, she writes books that are about personal growth and, and wellness. So it sounds like we're in for a really good evening tonight. Yes, and I, we've had a lot of speakers over the years. And I consider her an A-plus on public speaking. So it, it's always a treasure to have her here. All right. So don't go anywhere. We're in for a great show tonight here on Health Box. Thank you all for coming out tonight to hear about becoming younger by the day. Now, this is a curious topic because on the one hand, why should we want to be any age other than the age we are? I mean, obviously, we live in a youth culture, which is not such a great idea because it takes everybody after a certain point and tends to put them out to pasture. One of the things that I have discovered in midlife and that I've heard from a lot of other, at least women, in this age group is they say, I feel like I've become invisible. Now, a lot of you are younger and some of you are guys, so I don't know if you've experienced this or not. Now, certainly, growing older is not a bad thing, and even looking older is not completely a bad thing because it's how we see people and how we recognize people. If I were here tonight, for example, with my 21-year-old daughter, and we both looked the same age, it would be disconcerting. You wouldn't know who was the mom and who was the kid. Things just wouldn't be quite right. So when I talk about becoming younger by the day, it's not that kind of younger. It's the kind of vitality that defies time. In this book, in the beginning of Younger by the Day, which is the only, they call it, anti-aging day book. Now, I hate that phrase, anti-aging. We are anti-falling apart, but very much pro-aging and becoming older and more wonderful. And there are so many people in the health movement that we can look to who have lived to be really advanced ages and they do amazingly well. I think one who's really well known right now is Jack LaLanne, who recently celebrated his 90th birthday. I can remember at the age of 10 doing Jack LaLanne imitations. Yeah, you did one too. They could really get a laugh out of your parents. That was the one time that you could maybe get some attention that you didn't get every other time. But Jack is now 90 years old. He's just come out with a new juicer. So these are people that we can really look to to make every phase of life seem exciting and wonderful. <clears throat> so in this book, in the acknowledgments, I acknowledge two special people and one group that you know. I talk about my Ayurvedic doctor because Ayurvedic healthcare has been a really important part of this for me. Learning the cycles of the day and the cycles of life, Ayurveda translates as the science of long life. And someone else that I acknowledge in this book is what I call the thriving raw food community of New York City. 
That's you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because the inspiration of knowing people who are so committed to living vibrantly. And you know, living vibrantly is different from just living healthfully. As Donna said, I've been around natural hygiene for a really long time. I got interested because I was fat. I was fat from the time I was maybe a year old, off and on until I was 32. So I learned all kinds of things. You know, nothing is for no reason. If I had not been fat, I probably would not have the wonderful life that I have today because I wouldn't have explored all the things that I've explored. But one of the things that I started looking into when I was about 20 was natural hygiene. So I learned a lot about raw foods, fresh foods, foods, and I'm really grateful for that. So what I'd like to share with you this evening is a day. I'd like to start in the morning and go through the evening with some ideas for how you can become younger by the day. Now, everything we do makes us either age or rejuvenate. See, there are two ways that people age. There's chronological age and there's physiological age. Chronological age, you can't do a thing about. Chronological age is that date on your birth certificate. And it is 25, 37, 52, 68, whatever age you are. Based on your heredity, your genetics, you're going to reach that age and be at a certain level of health and vitality. If that were all there were, it would be pretty depressing because we couldn't do anything about it. Other than the genetically gifted, we'd all be up a creek or we'd need to have all the fun we could have in the first 30 years because there wouldn't be anything after that. But there's another way that we age and that's physiological aging. Now, my grandmother used to talk about carousing. That's not a word you hear a lot anymore, but as the country becomes more and more conservative, we might hear it more. But carousing was what she meant by people who stayed out late and people who drank too much alcohol, people who smoked cigarettes, both the kind you could buy at the gas station and those funny ones you rolled yourself. All of this was what she would have described as hard living. And hard living, obviously, makes a person look old sooner. You can think of certain people in the media. I'm thinking right now of a country western singer who looks real old for his age, probably because a lot of hard living. But we do some hard living in ways that we really can't help. And one of the reasons that as people get older, even people who have been living pretty well, they'll reach a certain point and they'll say, what happened? I thought I was doing so well, but all of a sudden I feel like I just aged 10 years almost overnight. Well, I think what happens is that many times substances and practices are put into our lives either when we didn't know any better or other people did it to us or for us and we're dealing with the after effects now. So when I think about my life, my dad was a doctor and even though he had a lot of, of um, old time natural kind of beliefs in his practice, he was an osteopath, he also was trying to be more modern and more medical. So probably like most of you, I was vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And when I got sick, I was given antibiotics. In those days, they didn't quite get it that antibiotics didn't work on viruses. So anytime I got a cold, I pretty much got antibiotics. I also traveled a lot as a child. My mother moved to Spain, which in those days was considered a tropical, almost third world country. So I was immunized against all sorts of tropical diseases, uh, yellow fever. I was given the malaria prophylaxis three times because I went to Spain three times as a child. So all these chemicals, all these poisons, everything that came into me in my life, I've been carrying around. One condition, one health condition that I had that was not at all life-threatening, I was given the most dangerous drugs for. I had acne as a teenager, so I was treated with x-ray treatments, which we now know can cause thyroid cancer, and later I took Accutane, which now has, has elevated to the status of lawsuit drug. 
Now we know as raw fooders, natural hygienists, wherever you are on this spectrum, that any drug is poison. Even those that at times are necessary, they're still poison. You can't get away from that. But only some drugs get to be lawsuit drugs. A lawsuit drug is one whose effects have been shown to be so bad for so many people that not only does the medical profession get to make money off it, the legal profession gets to make money off it with a class action lawsuit. So Accutane is now one of those. So I woke up one morning when I was 50 years old, and I felt like somebody had come in in the night and they had stolen my body that I was used to and they had replaced it with another one. Now this was a big shock because even though all the things that I just mentioned to you had happened in my life and even though I had been obese for pretty much 30 years, that was all in my past and I've lived really healthfully I'd been trim, I had exercised, I had done all the things that I thought were good, and I woke up at the age of 50 with a very shocking anatomy. First, I felt tired, just felt tired. And then I even looked a little different. I felt like my, my flat abdomen had kind of rounded, and everything, when I looked just out of the corner of my eye, didn't look like me anymore. It looked like my mom. <laughs> Pretty scary stuff. Everybody, I think, wakes up one morning and realizes, oh gosh, I'm not young anymore. It might happen at 35, when you notice a slightly receding hairline. It might happen at 40 when you get the restaurant check or a bill comes in the mail, and in order to see it, you find yourself holding it out here. And for many women, it does happen around 50 with the hormonal changes of menopause. Whenever it happens, it can be really discouraging or it can be a wake-up call. And I opted to take it as a wake-up call because we know that people live long nowadays. Statistically, if a woman reaches 50 who's never had heart disease or cancer, she will statistically live to be 94. Well, even though I was tired and my stomach wasn't as flat as it had been the day before, I didn't have heart disease or cancer, and I knew I had 44 years left. So I wanted to make them pretty good 44 years. So I went into a study of how to get younger in all the positive ways. And that's what I'd like to share with you tonight. Now as I look around, I see a lot of you are young. And I'm thinking, oh, wouldn't that be awful to come to a talk and all you get out of it is the good dinner? Well, let me say to you that if you start applying some of these ideas now, you are going to have the most fabulous life. When I was 19 years old, I went to a cosmetic counter at a department store and said, I want some eye cream, even though I'm only 19. And one of these wonderful, elegant women behind the counters, you know, the ones who wear all black and they're very pale and they have great big eyes and they look as if they know everything. And she said, if everyone started at 19, there would be a great many happier women at 40. So, if you start at 19 or wherever you are right now, wonderful things can happen in your health and your vitality for the rest of your life. So, let's start at the very best time of day, early in the morning. Now, who does not think that that is the best time of day? <coughs> Somebody? Good, good. There had to be one honest person in the room. Some people are night people. I know they exist because I gave birth to one. If reincarnation is true, my daughter lived her past life in China because only when we were in China did she ever get up and go to bed at the time that other people did. But the reason I say that the best time of day is the morning is that's when the earth is waking up. And when you get in tune with the earth, when you get in tune with the rhythms of the planet and align yourself with those rhythms, then you have to expend less energy to get through your own day. So ideally, 
you will awaken with the sun. You'll awaken between 6, 7 in the morning, something in that general time frame, and you'll awaken refreshed. Now, we happen to have light-blocking shades in our bedrooms. Anybody know about these things? They're like wooden slats, and they don't let anything through. So unless I remind my husband to keep the shades up a little bit at night, it's hard for me to awaken naturally in the morning. So make there be some sort of way for you to get light in the morning. If you can't do that, there's actually an alarm clock on the market that has no alarm, but it awakens you with the light, the light of the morning, or in this case, the artificial light that could have been of the morning, but instead it's from your clock. Whatever it is, allow yourself to be awakened that way. This is the way human beings have gotten up for time immemorial until somebody invented electricity and we started staying up late at night and waking up with noisy alarm clocks. That Ayurveda tells us, and that is that there are awakening energies on the planet around 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning. As the planet itself cycles through its own rhythms, this is when there's the kind of get up, get up energies. Because if you lie around in bed till 8, 8.30, the planet cycles in to another time. It's more of a lull. It's more of a quiet time. Now, if you don't believe that, how do you feel when you settle into your desk at 8.30 in the morning? Like getting up, jumping up and down and saying, whoop de doo or, oh golly, another day. <laughs> that 8, 8.30, 8 o'clock energy is not the best for getting up. So, you're up. Now, what are you going to do about it? You want to start the detoxification process of the day. You've just had the most detoxification you're going to get in the 24-hour period by sleeping at night. We'll talk about that as we finish the day. But when you go into the bathroom, when you get up in the morning, it's a good idea to scrape your tongue. And you can get an inexpensive plastic or metal tongue scraper at a health food store, any drug store, and just gently remove some of the debris. Now, any of you who have ever fasted know that you can get a lot of debris on your tongue whenever you're doing a really heavy cleanse. But even just sleeping through the night causes your body to get some of this out. In Ayurvedic terms, they use the Sanskrit word ama. And you want to get that off, and then you can just rinse your mouth and feel cleaner and feel better. Now, when I say rinse your mouth, probably a lot of people are thinking about things like Listerine and, and mouthwash, and probably most of us aren't using those kinds of things anymore because they're very harsh. But there is a wonderful way to use something in your mouth in the morning that has actually been shown clinically in the West to um, prevent gum disease, to help strengthen your teeth and, and strengthen your gums. And this is to have a, a mouthwash of pure sesame oil. So you buy uncured sesame oil at a natural food store, just plain sesame oil. Spectrum makes it, several com companies make it. And just hold it in your mouth a couple of minutes. One minute is better than not at all. Two minutes is better than one if you can do it. When you spit it out, just spit it into a little Dixie cup, put it in the trash. You don't want to get a lot of that heavy oil and your pipes. But this is a nice way to cleanse your mouth and strengthen your gums. From there, just, just what you would use a regular mouthwash, just maybe half of a little shot glass full. You all remember what a shot glass is, right? A, a wheat grass glass full. How's that? Half a wheat grass glass full. Did you say sesame? Sesame. Sesame oil. Is that the unrefined? Unrefined, but uncured. You can buy a cured sesame oil that they use for some kind of Asian cooking. You don't want that. Now, speaking of sesame oil, another wonderful thing to do in the morning, not every morning if you don't have the time, but lots of mornings if you can get to it, is to do a self-massage with sesame oil. Some people prefer almond oil, especially in the uh, warmer times of year, but sesame oil is great. 
It's a way, according to Ayurveda, to give yourself a protection from the elements. And I find that in the winter, when I tend to get really cold, and when I'm eating a lot of raw foods, I do tend to get colder than usual, to do this warm sesame oil massage in the morning really helps me feel warmer all through the day. So the way you do it is take the same sesame oil that you're using for gargle, but put it in a little plastic bottle and put that plastic bottle in a cup of hot water. And while you're brushing your teeth, scraping your tongue, doing the mouth rinse, your sesame oil can be heating up to where it's comfortably warm. And then you start with your head. Now obviously if you're not going to wash your hair, don't do your hair that morning. But ideally, if you're going to do a whole massage, you start with your head, just rub it in circular motions with the flats of your hand. When you get to your face, use upward motions, the way that we don't want our skin sagging down this way, so you want to work up with it. If you have very oily skin and find that your skin reacts and you get some blotches from putting oil on it, then skip your face. But a lot of people, even with oily skin, can use the sesame oil and find that it works well for them. When you get to the extremities, you want to go, let me borrow your arm because I have to hold this thing. You want to go straight up and down on the long bones and then in round circular motions around the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and all the joints. Then thank you. Work the oil into your hands. Be very gentle on your torso, nice round motions. Again, long motions on the legs, round at the hip joints, the knees, the ankles, and spend extra time on your feet. We've all probably enjoyed reflexology, and you can get some of those benefits yourself. So if you're hurried in the morning and you can't do the whole massage, just do your head and your feet. Those are supposed to be the most important. Feels wonderful. Then you can either step right into the shower, be really careful because you're going to be oily and greasy and slippery, so you might want to wear thongs or put plastic in the shower, be, be careful that if it's possible to leave the oil on, put on a bathrobe and go do your meditation and then get into the shower, you'll get even more benefits. Now meditation has actually been shown in clinical studies to make people physiologically younger. So most amazing thing, I remember when I was a fat kid and a fat young adult and every now and then somebody would say to me, well have you thought about meditating? And I remember thinking, what's wrong with you? That doesn't burn any calories. Well, I've learned since that it does something more important than that. When you meditate or when you sit, it gives you an opportunity to experience a kind of rest that you can't get just sitting watching television or even in sleep because it puts you into this state of restful alertness this wonderful way to be aware of the world and yet separate from it at the same time. One study showed that people who had practiced meditation regularly for five years or more were 12 years younger physiologically than those who hadn't meditated. Now everybody, subtract 12 from your current age. Wouldn't that be nice? It's a wonderful thing. So how do you meditate if you don't already do it. The first thing to do is to be prepared that you might be bored. Now this is New York City. We do not know how to be bored. But you know what? Sometimes it's okay. They say in the Far East that boredom is the highest state of receptivity. So give yourself the opportunity to sit and see what happens. So. To do the kind of sitting that's going to make you younger, you can sit on the floor like a yogi, or you can just sit on a chair like an American. And you can cross your legs or just put your feet flat on the floor. You want to have your spine pretty straight. You don't have to be straight like a Marine Corps recruit, but straight enough that the energy flow is nice and long and strong you sit, you can place your hands on your knees, palms upward, 
and you watch your breath going in your nostrils and coming out. That, with nothing else, is meditation. If you think that will bore you to death and you'll never do it a second day, you can decorate your meditation a little bit with a word or a phrase that I'm sure you're all familiar with that's called a mantra. But I like for Western people to use a phrase that's in English because we want to know what things mean. I remember in the late 1960s, I went to my first love-in. I was living in Kansas City. They were probably having love-ins in California years before that. But I went to one in Kansas City, and they had all of these very interesting people in very interesting garments who had us chanting around as we danced, and we were all supposed to go, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And I remember thinking, oh God, if I'm saying something really awful and terrible, forgive me. Well, I know I wasn't saying anything awful and terrible now, but at the time I wasn't so sure. But still, I am an American Western person and I like English words. So what I love to use for meditation is to breathe in on the phrase, all is, and exhale, well. All is well. So try that for a second with me. Close your eyes. Inhale. All is. Exhale. Well. So you can just continue this silently for a minute while I talk. All is well. You're inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your nose and let yourself feel calm and feel safe. They say that even three slow, deep inhalations and exhalations like this can quiet you down, lower your blood pressure, help you make clearer decisions.